Yes, a very good morning, uh, everybody. Hope I am audible and everybody can uh, see the shared screen as well. So today's first session we are starting with, this is Dr. Gomti Mahajan. I am uh, working as a consultant microbiologist and the medical head of a super specialty hospital. We'll be taking in the first session a very current topic that is the rising menace of antimicrobial resistance and role of microbiologists in the current scenario. So I'm very sure that many of us will be facing different kinds of challenges as our role as microbiologists in the hospital these days, because the role is now not confined to the limits of the laboratory anymore. So starting with the session, A very important and a crucial port made by Alexander Fleming, the discoverer of the very first antibiotic. The thoughtless person playing with penicillin is morally responsible for the death of the patient who comes with penicillin resistant organism. I hope you all understand the significance of this port. It is very much pointing to us the clinicians, the microbiologists, to all who are involved in working with these very important molecules known as antibiotics. So the onus lies on us, and this is a very important responsibility being shared by many of us. So coming to a basic definition, when I talk about antimicrobial resistance, I talk about the ability of any microbe to resist the medication which is used to treat it. So that may relate to a bacteria or a virus or a fungus or any parasite. And when I talk about antibiotic resistance, so then it applies to the bacteria and the antibiotic used to kill that bacteria. So I'm very sure that everybody is very well versed with these basics, a few slides I'll be talking. Talking about 1960 to 70s, when many of the newer antibiotic molecules were coming in the market, and imagine the scenario those days. The futurists were looking towards the year 2000 as the end of the infections. The experts those years said that bacteria and viral diseases will be virtually wiped out. And where are we standing in 2020 onwards? the pandemics ushering in, all the time we are talking about the end drug resistances, multi-drug resistances. The scenario now is entirely different. We are just on the verge of losing the superbug war. So many talking about the silent pandemic. So many journals, so many articles talking about the end of antibiotic era. We'll be landing up into post-antibiotic era. Antibiotics are rather killing us. Bacteria are standing smart in front of these antibiotics and we are facing this alarming statistics which says by 2050, the predictions are the mortality will be up to one crore. Every day WHO is mentioning our stats higher than so many other countries. Sharing a very basic slide when I'm talking about antibiotic resistance. We are having both kinds of bacteria in our body, very less numbers. We are having the resistant bacteria being shown with this black colored plasmid and susceptible bacteria as well. When the antibiotics are exposed, the susceptible bacteria dies, leaving behind these resistant bacteria, which then multiply and all the new formed bacteria, they are drug resistant and they become dominant. So in a patient, now the dominant population is of the resistant bacteria. So he can be reinfected, he can get a new infection, which will be with this resistant bacteria upon which none of the newer molecules will be able to combat. So now the patient is having a multi-drug resistant infection. I hope everybody is well versed with the selective pressure also. 
So what is selective pressure? Selective pressure is the pressure exerted by the antibiotic. That antibiotic molecule is exerting a pressure because of which this resistant bacteria, they are multiplying and the normal flora of our gut is being suppressed. Now in our gut, if there are few resistant bacteria and rest are all susceptible, the susceptible normal flora is giving them a competition to survive. The resistant bacteria darta hai normal flora se because it has need for the nutrients and for the other survival factors. But if we are taking antibiotics like this, our normal flora is destroyed and it leads to open nutrition for the resistant bacteria and ultimately it multiplies and colonizes our gut. So coming to our undergraduate fundamentals, resistance can be of two types. It can be intrinsic or natural, which a pathogen is born with. So there are a lack of metabolic processes or target site on which these antibiotics cannot work or it can be acquired. When I say it can be acquired, it can be with genetic methods, chromosomal, like any mutation is happening. And then because of that mutation, that bacteria is becoming resistant. Or there can be some uh, chromosomal methods, example, sorry, extra chromosomal with plasmids and all. Otherwise, we can have biochemical mechanisms. Can bacteria lose their resistance capacity as well? I got like for the last two, three days, I was working on this topic. So my students were also asking me this. Yes, it's a reversible process. This reverse process can happen, but it's a very slow process. When the selective pressure is lost, bacteria can even lose their resistance capacity. So very broadly, I'll be taking the points, not getting delving into the topics which you have heard of. Mainly, we'll be talking our role in combating the resistance in today's session. So what are the various causes for the antimicrobial resistance? The first cause, everybody of us talks daily. I'm very sure the microbiologists who are attending the session, that's a very current topic we talk about. That is the inappropriate and misuse of antibiotics. Overuse, disuse, you know, misuse of antibiotics. I'll be taking each of the points further for discussion. But the two points which are little on the back foot. Second is the indiscriminate use of antibiotics in agriculture and wet practice. This is one of the very major point these days. And it sometimes supersedes even our working in the hospital. And the third is insufficient research and development in the antibiotic area. So we'll take each and every point into the discussion. I have not made my slides very heavy, but we'll be talking about it. So inappropriate use and misuse. I have taken ECDC points to elaborate this. Unnecessary prescription of antibiotics for flus, for viral infections, for non-infectious causes. Like so many times we are having febrile patients in which the infection is not the reason. But now we are so used to, all of our clinicians are so used to prescribing antibiotics. Even if we know that it will not play any role, Somewhere in our mind, we just keep on building that prophylactic hoga, kuch future infection ye rok lega, which is very, very wrong. With such clear symptoms of flu, with such clear symptoms of viral infections, which are so common in this season also. Like every day I'm taking round from my OPD patients also. And so many prescriptions I'm getting for my uh, this uh, internal medicine people, they are just writing very well knowing that this is a viral infection. The symptoms itself shows that flu in the patient itself is very clearly visible that yes, this is a viral infection. Somehow they keep on writing of maintain over it. And I'm like, why? But then there's no specific answer. And I'm very sure each one of you must be facing this problem. Because generally our clinicians tend to say we need not learn it from a microbiologist, what we should prescribe and we should not. But this is the right time that they should learn that. Broad spectrum antibiotics, very frequent. If you're doing auditing of the OPD slips, I'll take IPD part later. If you're taking OPD slips also into the audit, you will find so many broad spectrum antibiotics. OPD patient is coming with a very, very specific symptoms. If a patient is having some pain in the throat, you need to be very specific. If there's some skin problem, you need to be very specific. 
but it's not like that we are just writing all broad spectrum antibiotics i do not know the reason for that but still it is like quite in the trend and then one reason mainly is the patient failure to adhere to the regimes prescribed as soon as the patient thinks he is okay he will not try to get there ki nahi mujhe ye pura apna course karna hai so these are the local problems which are facing every day the second i was talking about was the antibiotic resistance because of agriculture because of this wet practice because of animal husbandry i was working on a research project over this topic and you cannot imagine how magnanimous this problem is when i talk about farm animals we are not using antibiotics only to cure the infections we are using these antibiotics to prevent the infections i was working with a project and we used to visit so many cattle areas and you cannot imagine the kind of antibiotics and the quantity of antibiotics they are giving to these farm animals in the morning itself they start dissolving the huge quantity of the antibiotics in the water and animals are fed all these antibiotics so that because they are living together and they are living in the conditions which are not very sanitized or hygienic so they want to prevent the infection in that case such huge antibiotics they are changing whole of the flora of these animals very similar is the scenario in the agriculture all these genetically modified breeds which we are making all these better strawberries you are eating all these better looking apples we are having the good looking vegetables and fruits in the markets you are seeing these days these are all genetically modified and so how they are done a lot of antibiotics are used a lot of gene transfer is done very uh, commonly these resistant genes by genetically engineering they are put into these newer seeds and so this is a very big challenge which stands in front of us many of the latest studies have shown a lot of enorofloxacin was used in animals to prevent them from salmonella and that has transferred in humans the salmonella became resistant to ciprofloxacin after enorofloxacin being used in the animals so this is also a very major challenge which should be looked into antibiotics being used in animals for treatment is okay but for the prevent prevention of the diseases for prophylactic use it's a major risk so a lot of legislation has started to use antibiotic as a growth promoter and as you can see in this figure india is way behind yet so that is a very major reason that in our country we are not able to control it orange shades shows no ban areas so you can see that largely asia is lagging behind we have no ban on these animal husbandry and all so that needs to be done then the last point was antibiotics are in fall yes there was a huge you know there was a rising graph in our 70s and 80s when the pharmaceutical companies thought that making antibiotic is a very big thing a lot of money was being put on a lot of research was being put on that but now what is happening is that because we are time and again talking about antibiotic resistance we want a very good utilization of these antibiotics so we are just all the time talking that it should be wisely used doses should be maintained the stewardships are talked about and the resistance also itself is making a molecular a big failure antibiotic molecules are going into failure after the use of 2 3 years only so these antibiotic companies are not interested in making antibiotic molecules anymore these pharmaceutical companies they are coming up with multivitamins which are all the time in demand they want to make some calcium molecules they want to make the medicines for bp for diabetes for cholesterol which we are prescribing to our patients all the time without thinking that we are over prescribing for antibiotic the trend is really on the fall right now hardly there are few molecules in the pipeline and we are with the, all your carbapenemase is coming out we are just standing on a finishing line so all these points are actually posing a very grave scenario in front of us antibiotics are coming down our superbugs are increasing and we are standing with no drugs in hand 
So the scenario is really, really grave. What we are talking needs to be talked about. This is one graph which is comparing the Western world with Indian world, basically. So this is excessive consumption of carbocalyms. So the Western world, maybe the problem is equally there. In all my symposiums and talks, I always say it is not that our country is facing something else. Everybody is facing that. But then people have started putting a constraint on it, on the misuse, on the overuse. Though we have also started, but still we need to catch up a lot. Right now, the things are bad. There is no stopping for these bugs. And I, as I said, antibiotics are on the lower side. And these villains are you know, really growing up. This everybody of you must be knowing that escape organisms, which are giving us a high time right now. So from escape with K, it has come to escape with C. The Klebsiella pneumonia has been replaced with Clostridium difficile. Clostridium difficile is itself not a multi-drug resistant bacteria, but it colonizes the gut of the patient who is in high antibiotic load. And it forms a membrane inside the gut and causes pseudomembranous colitis, which is a very, very difficult disease later on. I'll be coming to this topic again because you must be attending so many conferences these days on these topics. Somehow developing countries were targeted earlier, near 2009-2010, when Lancet reported NDM1 and New Delhi and India was like quite on the frame in the world map, which is not a right thing to do because in today's world, the traveling is lots, lot of people traveling around, a lot of stuff traveling around, a lot of food traveling around. The, you know, it's a global map which has been concise now. So to name some countries after these resistance mechanism is not right. In 2011, Lancet edited, he made a formal apology about it after naming that Indian. And then it was said in a very legal way that countries should not be, uh, these genes should not be named after countries. Like then it was, you know, BIM when Italy was involved, GIM when Germany was involved. So it has to be according to mechanism and not according to the country. Because whatever is the origin, the spread is very fast. And this, I always say, antibiotic resistance, it is a global threat. It's a pandemic. It is not like one country is facing it. It's like developed countries are having their own challenges. Underdeveloped having their own challenges. And developing country like ours, we are fighting our own battle. So it basically involves all of the globe. And after COVID, we have seen like, we cannot talk about these things confined to one country. We cannot put the onus on one country because it will spread really fast. So you have seen that impact of antimicrobial resistance is multifactorial. It is leading to very, very high mortality, basically in the areas like ICUs, in your transplant units, in your onco units where the patients are already immunocompromised and the load of antibiotics is very high which further leads to the medical costs, increasing the burden for the patient multifactorial. So with this, I leave you again on the same crossroads. You must be saying that Dr. Gomti is talking about the same things which we know. When to start, why to start, what is happening, how it is happening, where it is happening, and who shall start, you know, stopping it because all these graphs things newspaper cuttings the article journal talking about it you must have been through all this so today i wanted to keep the focus of my lecture is how we microbiologists gonna help it so who who is the question so the answer is a combined effort a teamwork neither you will be able to do anything all alone nor the clinicians nor the management so it is a combined effort. Right now I'm working for a dual role. I'm also at a managing part of my hospital. It's a super speciality hospital I'm working with. 
and I'm also working as the ICO and the microbiologist for my hospital. So I know it is a very tight, knitted, combined effort which you will require. We are the ones who will be diagnosing the infection first. We are the ones who will be releasing the susceptibility reports one. So we are very pivotal part of this scenario, very, very pivotal. So if there are any PG students attending this lecture, a very important role on you. Any young microbiologists who have come in, please do not confine yourself to the lab scenario. It is high time that we should all be going out, moving out. I'm very sure when I'm talking all this, many of you must be thinking, Ki nahi, ma'am, none of the clinicians are listening to us. We're not having any rounds yet. There are so many hospitals I've seen, they're not involving microbiologists in the morning rounds, which is really wrong. So we should make a combined team and then we should start working on it. So I have divided that sections separately. First, I will talk about what you should work as in your laboratories, as a microbiologist when you're working in the lab. So first thing, you guys should be very, very strict about your specimens and reporting quality. First thing, you should always ensure that high quality specimens are only processed. Appropriate specimens ko hi aap accept kare aur unhi ko hi aap process kare. This is the first thing I would like to talk about. Reject poor quality specimens. My slides are gonna get a little heavy now, but every point is important. So I would like to talk little without stickers now. First is rejecting the poor quality specimens. Ye line aapne bahut bar suni hogi, aapko pata hogi, but I would like to ask you that how many of you actually reject poor quality specimens? Every one of you attending the session knows that sputum sample over 25 epithelial cells, if you're seeing per OIF, you need to reject. Now I need to ask you how many samples you're sending back every day. Start doing it. Start putting the notes on your requisition forms. Sample rejected. It is not sputum. This is saliva. Your clinicians and your patients need to know the difference between spit and sputum. Do not report AFP on salivary samples, please. A patient may be having MTB. Patient may be having AFP positive thing, but you are reporting it negative because you are reporting it on saliva. Start putting the samples back. Do not take the swab samples with a dried specimen. You will not be able to report anything on that. If you're not getting high cervical swabs, stop reporting vaginal swabs, please. All your requisition form, start putting long notes and start sending back the sample to your clinicians. Request your management to have these clinical meets. They are very, very important. The, these clinical meets are not about the pathologist and the physicians. It is about microbiologist and the physician as well. If they are not starting, you start doing it. Second is do not report everything that goes. You have to be very clear on what is contamination, what are commensals and what are pathogens. If you're not able to differentiate, I'm very sorry, you are doing a very wrong reporting. So you should know, like, you should not report any uh, this uh, pathogenic, what is pathogenic in sputum and what is commensal in sputum. What you should give in vaginal swab and what you should not give in vaginal swab. What is significant bacteria? In what case significant bacteria is important? In what case it is not important? So like I cannot open all of the topic in today's session, but everything is there quite in the text. We know a lot of things, but somehow we are not practicing it. Lab requires a specimen, not a swab of a specimen. Always prefer your pus in a syringe, you know, in a specicam. Swabs, dry swabs, reject straight away. You will not get anything from them except for your aerobic spore bearers. Make your lab manuals, please. This is very important. Uh, many of the labs are not undergoing NADM. So that doesn't mean that you should not have any manuals, any procedure manuals for you. Make your procedure manuals yourself. And I've seen so many microbiologists who are working in hospitals or working in single lab. Don't Pick lab manuals from people. Don't copy paste them. They will not serve any purpose. Make your lab procedure manuals, make them very simple, 
your all your staining all your culture procedures should be written in short and they should be pasted on the walls of your lab your technician should be so well versed with them simple small points tell your physicians tell your clinicians to collect the specimen prior to entry packet it's such a simple point but in a hospital even in my hospital every day i find that so many times antibiotic is given and then the blood culture is sent you have to hammer them time and again time and again always put your antibiotic sensitivities on clinically significant isolates only do not waste your strips do not waste your discs do not waste your vitex on all these insignificant isolates so these are very very important things and if you're not finding the your clinicians are abiding by the things please straight away reject this sample good sample is the foundation for a good report empirical therapy what is empirical therapy empirical therapy is the therapy which your clinicians are giving to the patient before the report for the sensitivity has come up you have not yet reported the culture and sensitivity to your physician and before that that empirical therapy is being given so for that your physician needs to know about the site of infection whether it's a colonization or infection the rate of antimicrobial resistance which you are reporting it to them through your antibiogram i'll be coming to all those points you always need to give your opinion about the combination antimicrobial therapy he is working it perform careful patient monitoring for duration of antimicrobial therapy now the patient is on antibiotic so the careful monitoring is required both by the treating physician and by the microbiologist and wherever possible please involve a clinical pharmacologist in doing for medical colleges it's very easy because they have epidemiologists they have the pharma people they have microbiologists so the team can be formed for private it is little bit of challenge but i tell you if you will start it will be done one week two weeks aapke medicine wale ko lagega aapke surgeon ko lagega that is it is an undue interference from your side but once you start giving your inputs they will start appreciating it and with time they will be actually waiting for you ki microbiologist aayega to we start doing the round but then your clinical microbiology should also be sound you should know which drug can cause which kind of organ dysfunction kis drug ka excretion kaise ho raha hai you should be little updated this slide is very important communication is the key we always keep on blaming our hospital clinicians ki ye hame batate nahi ye hame puchte nahi but so many times even we are not playing our role well communication is very important i do understand it is not possible to talk with your treating physicians all the time but sometimes you can put the small notes on your reports i have seen so many hospitals aajkal vitec pe report nikal raha hai and the same elaborate lengthy reports microbiologists are releasing for their physicians which is so unfair make your own little word setups make the report little concise add your own little key notes your foot notes those people will forget with time like what mrsa will not respond to you can always write mrsa isolated it will not respond to any of these drugs you are having esbls they will not respond to these drugs if you are repeatedly getting the same kind of esbl in the same area you can just declare it a small outbreak in your hospital you can talk to your consultant ki sir isi pattern ki esbl icu mein mujhe चार दिन में छह बार मिल गया सो सम ऑफ योर स्टाफ मस्ट बी कैरिंग इट इन द हैंड्स और इट इट इज समवेयर ऑन द हायर सर्विसेज व्हिच वी आर गिफ्टिंग टू द पेशेंट्स सो वी हैव टू हैव लिटिल पॉलिसीज वी हैव टू हैव अ लिटिल एवरीथिंग नीड्स टू बी टॉक्ड वी कैन डिस्कस सम कल्चर ग्रोथ वी कैन डिस्कस सम ग्राम स्टेन फाइंडिंग्स इफ द पेशेंट इज क्रिटिकल वी आर सीइंग ऑन ग्राम स्टेन इन एसिनोबैक्टर वी कैन ऑलवेज पिक अप द फोन एंड टॉक टू आर क्लिनिशियन की सर लग रहा है हमारे को ग्राम नेगेटिव कोकोबैसिलाई इट मे बी एसिडिटो आई टेल यू टूमोरो वंस एसिडिटो हैज कम एंड सेंसिटिविटी हैज नॉट कम गेट यू कैन ऑलवेज टॉक की सर एसिडिटो बैक्टर है और हमारे एंटीबायोग्राम के हिसाब से ये ऐसे रेजिस्टेंट होता है आई टेल यू द सेंसिटिविटी टूमोरो और टू नाइट सो अ लिटिल कम्युनिकेशन कैन रियली हेल्प देम टू डिस्कलेट और एस्कलेट देयर एंटीबायोटिक्स your surveillance culture surveillance makes an other full session but i have just included this one slide that your surveillance culture which you are picking up 
is also very important in your strategy to control your multi drug resistance bacteria aapka surveillance culture reflect karta hai ki aapke hospital mein kis tarah ka flora grow kar raha hai so now i'll be talking about three important aspects antibiograms antibiotic policy and antibiotic stewardship so they are common different beads of a same necklace right so antibiotic uh, antibiotic uh, biograms are very important for your hospital A lot of queries which I get every day with the small labs and small uh, setup like twenty twenty five beds is that ma'am, our isolate is not enough. We have to make an antibiogram. We have twenty five isolates not coming out for every bacteria. So what you people do is you three four labs can collaborate together. You can make a local antibiogram for yourself. You three four hospitals you can collaborate with small setups. You can have microbiologists. Hai. या अच्छे टेक्नीशियंस हैं एमएससी माइक्रो के जिनको समझ में है कि कैसे एंटीबायोटिक रिपोर्ट करना है आप अपना डेटा क्लब कर लें और अपने लिए एक लोकल एंटीबायोग्राम फ्रेम करें सो दैट यू गेट टू नो व्हाट ट्रेंड इज गोइंग ऑन इन योर लोकल एरिया इन योर स्मॉल सिटी इन योर स्मॉल टाउन इन योर स्मॉल जोन इन योर स्मॉल डिविजन सो दीज एंटीबायोग्राम्स दे आर वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टू नो द ट्रेंड विच इज देयर फॉर द माइक्रो पैथोजी this will really help your consultants and this will really help you to frame your antibiotic policy so what is an antibiogram antibiogram is basically we are taking the susceptibility and resistance pattern of all the isolates which we are getting so in an area i have seen i have observed in various of my inspections that kisi ek area mein clep bahut important hoga wo aapke hospital mein bhi hoga aapke hospital ke nazdeek jo hospital hoga wahan bhi aa raha hoga because these icu patients these critical patients they keep on shifting from one hospital to another you may be getting referrals and these referrals are not coming directly from home so they are not carrying the community acquired organisms in them they are having hospital acquired infections so the nearby places can frame the local antibiogram and the big hospitals or the big labs who are getting sufficient samples they can have their own antibiogram and when you people meet when there is any microbiology meet and all we can discuss these antibiograms on you know the synopsis of these antibiograms can be discussed like which antibiotic is working in your hospital so bases are the antibiogram results us basis pe aap apni antibiotic policy frame kar do not pick antibiotic policies in any hospital like this there is a um, government of india it has released a very good frame for antibiotic policy that's a very wonderful frame so you have been given the diseases the empirical treatment which you pick up on but you should make your own antibiotic policy on your own antibiogram so like what we did i'll, I'll tell you an example the hospital may amica seem bilkul khatam hone pe tha it was just not working because my pediatricians my neonatologists my medicine guy they were all king amica seen as first line so it just stopped working and we put emicas in into the second line i never used to report in first line agar sensitive bhi aa gaya mai report hi nahi karti i used to have my own first line drugs and slowly now after 3 years emicasin is again back so this is how you should frame your antibiotic policy antibiotic policy is a very dynamic document which needs to be revised now and then reviewed now and then based upon your sensitivity patterns so if you are having a good antibiotic policy you will see its effectiveness in the usage of antimicrobial agents it will prevent communicable diseases this document is very very important document isko aap thodi der baith ke banaye and then you distribute the copies send it to your ortho send it to your surgeons send it to your di surgeons send it to your medicine people tell them this is two page each for you read it either you change it according to you whatever modifications you want else it will be implied and once you have implied the policy then you have to have some checks that also i'll show you few of the forms by which you can do it right now what we need is a very implementable antibiotic policy which can be implemented agar aap lab mein baith ke ek perfect policy banayenge ki first drug hamare ko first generation ke phylosporin mein dena hai तो आपके सर्जेंट्स उस पर नहीं काम करेंगे इफ यू टेल योर ऑर्थो यू नो हुज डूइंग नी रिप्लेसमेंट कि आप इसको सिफल एक्सिन ही दे डॉक्टर साहब ही विल नॉट डू इट ही विल पुट पाइप्रोसेलिन टैजोबैक्टीरिया 
सो टॉक विद हिम यू नो एंड जेल समवेयर इन बिटवीन कि चलो डॉक्टर साहब हम लोग सिर्फ ट्रैक्स ऑन से शुरू कर लेते हैं सो डू नॉट गो फॉर अ परफेक्ट थिंग राइट नाउ गो फॉर एन इंप्लीमेंटेबल थिंग जो यू आल्सो सजेस्ट एंड योर सर्जन्स एंड योर फिजिशियंस आर आल्सो एग्रीइंग द पॉइंट कि यस चलो लेट्स डू इट आर यू आई होप यू आर गेटिंग माय पॉइंट वी आर लुकिंग फॉर अ प्रैक्टिकल सॉल्यूशन एट लीस्ट योर एंटीबायोटिक पॉलिसी विल कम इनटू फॉर्म इट विल कम इनटू अ रन शो it will not be a piece of paper only lying on the desk because nobody is gonna blindly follow a microbiologist like this you have said a drug and because your consultant will definitely say ki ma'am i have to treat the patient i have to take that onus i cannot take this big risk so you have to convince them that higher drugs are actually not required so how will you do it if you will from a fibra tezo if you like to bring him to a cephalexin he will not come so just Talk with them. Just give them your viewpoint. Give them those national policy guidelines, and see what he comes upon. And then, with that kind of discussion, come to a very middle way and implement your policy there. Every policy you make should be a very dynamic document. It's not a static document. It's a living document. आपको हो सकता है हर तीन महीने बाद review करना पड़े. आप देखें कि जो आपने प्रोफेलेक्टिक ड्रग दिया है सर्जन को उसके साथ क्या आपके कोई सर्जिकल साइड इन्फेक्शन बढ़ तो नहीं रहे टेक दम इन टू कॉन्फिडेंस बिल्ड देयर कॉन्फिडेंस के डॉक्टर साहब हम लोग सेफ्ट्राइक जोन पे आए हैं आफ्टर दिस हाई ड्रग सी देर है नो एक्सरसाइज इन थ्री मंथ्स सो यू कैन गेन देयर कॉन्फिडेंस स्लोली बट फॉर दैट योर पॉलिसीज नीड टू बी रियल डायनमिक ये नहीं कि आपने यू हैव मेड अ पीस ऑफ पेपर एंड यू हैव गिवन टू योर You're just reporting. You're going back. Surgeon doesn't know what is going in lab. You don't know what is going in OT. That will it will not work. So after antibiogram and antibiotic policy, I'll be talking about antimicrobial stewardship. This is a very very important topic. Solution is prevention of nosocomial infections. Hospital required. The next speaker is taking this. So I think it will be a very good collision today. So antimicrobial stewardship. all those who have not yet started i would like you to start at a you can start it as a step 1 it is a time we should take antibiotic resistance very seriously so now after this lecture 12th to 18 november is the antibiotic awareness week so you can celebrate in your hospitals by framing anti stewardship committees in your hospitals and to frame the committee i'll just tell you i'll take this slide first how to frame a committee You may singly you won't be able to do this much of work. What I'm telling you. So you will have to have some people along with you. So how will you do it? So you yourself get involved. If you're a single microbiologist in the hospital, involve yourself. If you're working in a team, like it's a big lab, you are two three people, or it's a medical college, you are four five people. Then you make a team of microbiology. Then you should have infection control team in that. So infection control team, you are one. You can have your ICMs. you can have your icus so train them talk to them so those guys will not be as educated and informed as you so you have to take them into loop add your clinical pharmacists to do it in the beginning they'll not be very you know gelling up types but slowly if you'll have repeated meetings you'll take them along with rounds they'll get with you if you're not having id physicians take your internal medicine physician with you this is very very important this is your therapeutic pharma and therapeutic committee so you have to have that committee aap apne ek formula bhi decide kare ki yahi drugs hum log denge inme se you have to pick agar aapke paas residents hain mere paas jaise dnv residents hain so i am picking them for this committee members in rotations so make this committee and then you start doing this all the aim is to have a good clinical outcome and what all you need to do is better diagnosis improve dosing less duration combined therapy cycling cycling is sometimes you give one antibiotic and then you reserve it so that this antibiotic doesn't get resistant have some antimicrobial restrictions i'll talk about it it's a step by step procedure you cannot do it in one night ki aaj main round liya hai aaj is sab kuch theek ho jayega it will not happen believe me it will take you know 6 months a year for people to acknowledge that what you are doing is actually helping them pehle to unko ye kaha ye kya madam she is after her life all the time she comes and she increases the work for us she increases the paperwork for us it will take a year for your hospital staff 
and your consultants to recognize your work. But slowly, believe me, they'll recognize it. They'll be dependent on you. Vaccinate people, get the catheters out. Any kind of catheter in the patient is a source of infection. Target the pathogen, assess the experts, antimicrobial control, local data I talked about, colonization, contamination, break the chain. So these are all simple points which you need to work. So I'll be sharing few of the slides now, which are the bundles I'm using in my hospitals. You can have the screenshots if you want. And as per these bundles, in my apna add karne pura, or fir you start working upon it. It's a good move. Uh, so for my hospital, when antibiotic use bundle I have made, for that bundle, clinical rational hona chahiye for antibiotic initiation. And it should be documented why you're using this kind of antibiotics and it should be documented. Then appropriate samples for smear and culture collected and submitted to laboratory. So that you have to have. The appropriate samples are sent. How I'm checking this bundle, that also I'll show you the checklist. So antibiotics are selected according to the local policy and risk group. Antibiotics are they ordered as per plan? Plan is like name, dose, route, frequency, and everything is there. So antibiotic plan should be there. Then I'm very strict. I want, if there is any you know, incision and drainage is required, do it. If there's a local foreign body, remove it first. Then go for antibiotic. If you're going antibiotics as such and local focus is there, it will not penetrate into the local axis. If there's some foreign body there, how much antibiotic you may give? The patient is not going to recover till the time focus is removed. So this is my bundle which I'm using. You can add or subtract points according to you. And this is the checklist which I'm using, my ICN fills it for me, that everything is being done. So this is the checklist. Clinical signs of infection are documented, appropriate sample sent, yes, no, whatever comments she want to put, she can put, like blood sample was sent before starting the antibiotic or after sending the antibiotic, IND was done or not, like this. So antimicrobial prescription is done according to the local guidelines. It is okay for the individual patient. Antibiotic plan was documented. I'll show you what uh, my antibiotic plan is also. Foreign body was removed or not. So your ICN can add comments in this all. And then you can give your RC or Kappa over this, right? So this is the antibiotic plan. Like you can add whatever you want to into it. I'm just showing you what we follow. So antibiotic plan is name of the antibiotic agent, root of the administration, what dose is being given, what is the dosing interval. You believe me, if you start checking your files, up ICU say start karne, itni bar nursing staff dosing interval miscalculate karta, which is so easy. But even then it is not done properly. If it's six hourly, they must be giving it eight hourly, sometimes 10 hourly, nights make a lot of mistakes. If you start seeing their files or you'll ask your ICN or ICUs to see the files, you'll find the mistakes. So what is the total duration plan? So did you switch from oral, yes, no, right? So any kind of reason column or any comment column you can use. Then I have made, that was the initiation bundle I talked about. When you have to start the antibiotic, I had a bundle. So this is my day three bundle. So by day three, kya hota hai ki aapka microbiological report generally aa jata hai. So ek minute day three bundle bana ke rakha hai. It was an antibiotic plan documented, tab tak ko document ho gaya file mein. Review of diagnosis after lab reports. Now lab reports have generally come by day three. So what is the review of diagnosis? You have isolated some bacteria. So did after isolation your consultant change the diagnosis? So if micro results are positive, so what adaptation has been made? IV se oral kuch hua ya nahi. And for this bundle also, I have a checklist. So whether this thing was done or not done. So bundles you can paste around and checklist you can give to your ICNs to follow daily. So it is like I'm telling you what we are following. You can just modify the things according. Iske alava, you have uh, procalcitonins with you. Many of you must be working on molecular diagnosis, PCRs and everything for the quick results. Always try to report your gram stain results. They're very, very helpful for your consultants. And once you start communicating, report your critical results to them. If you see something on blood cultures, you know, gram stain, you can tell so. 
there's a gram positive coca i can see probably we can have a staff or it can be micrococcus also so we can correlate you always correlate it to the clinical history if they are not sending you the clinical history you start putting the footnotes on the reports once you are elaborating you are talking you are sending them the verbal things or the written notes they'll also start communicating with you but once they need to know that you are a help because many people in the hospitals find microbiologists as a liability ki ab hamare ko daan machine kar denge ab hame kuch bolna shuru kar denge they'll be after our life so let's be little value so that they also recognize our importance and we too so the newer strategies new antimicrobials are coming in we have these stewardship programs you please make this the first step is you make a team and you start working with these kind of bundles little audit checks up i didn't show you my audit check for uh, prophylactic antibiotics you can make that also whether what antibiotic was given in prophylaxis how uh, you know kitna pehle wo diya gaya surgery se utna utna bhi aap follow karna shuru karenge so you go along with so you can take care of the rapid diagnostic tests we can use biomarkers like i told you procalcitonin strict infection control is must so i tried covering the major things in this class and i hope you make use of it so drug resistance is not gonna end that is for sure but we can combat it we can bring it to a down level so if no action today there will be no cure tomorrow so i do not know if the doubts are to be taken now or later but you just can put it in your chat box or you just can tell me whatever you want to know more thank you so much for the patient hearing so i am dr roini kalhan uh, and i think uh, this much is clear i am md microbiologist uh, assessor of nbh as well as uh, assessor of iso 1519 and today what i'll be talking about will be hospital infection control uh, a part of that uh, only will be taking up only the hospital associated infection uh because this has become uh, you know very important uh, topic in the coming uh, times uh because of the burden it's uh, causing uh, on the patients as well as the hospitals as well as the insurance companies you can say uh so if we see uh, what is the risk of uh, you know this hospital associated is also called as a healthcare associated infections now uh so what if we see what the risk is you know uh, there was a study uh, done in 2014 by cdc and where they found out that at least 4 4% of the hospitalized patients suffered from at least one of the hais and if you go by the absolute numbers in 2011 they uh, had you know uh, checked in uh, uh, in this around 6 lakh 48000 hospitalized patient they found that and they suffered from around 7 lakh 21000 infections uh, so that's a huge burden you know you know on the hospital a uh, huge uh, burden on the insurance companies and as well as a problem for the patients also and uh, what are the dominant infections uh, are usually the uh, if you go in the descending order it's the pneumonia surgical site infections uh, which are around 22% uh, then gastrointestinal infection around 17% utis that is around 13% and the blood stream infection that's around 10% and obviously this uh, you know burden is more the icu patients and uh, in a study which was done in the icu patients uh, across around 947 hospitals uh, that included around uh, 231000 uh, patients they found around 19.5% of the patients in icu had at least one or the other of hai uh, now coming to you know what the, what we mean or uh, what is the definition what we put as the hai that is the hospital or the healthcare uh, associated infections uh, so an infection which is acquired during hospitalization and which was not present or incubating at the time of uh, admission an infection that is acquired in the hospital and becomes evident after discharge from the hospital uh, in general uh, the infections that occur more than 48 to 72 hours after the admission and within 48 hours after discharge are defined as the hospital associated see uh only excluding few of the infections in which the incubation period is shorter than 48 to 72 hours that is few of the gastrointestinal gastroenteritis infection caused by caused by norvirus virus or few of the infection in which the incubation period is longer than 10 days for example hepatitis a these are few of the exceptions 
Otherwise, uh, most of the organism and their incubation period lies between 48 to 72 hours. So they are, uh, that's why considered to uh, 48 to 72 hours is taken as the, uh, you know, time period, uh, uh, which is considered after discharge also to be included in the hospital acquired or hospital associated. can be a preventable uh, or it can be a non-preventable. Uh, uh, in preventable, uh, the infection could have been altered and uh, that such alteration would have prevented the infection from occurring, like uh, if it is uh, if passed on from patient to patient or from, uh, uh, you know, healthcare workers to the patient uh, and a uh, few of the, uh, you know, your actions like not washing of hands between patients may, may have led to the transmission of organism. This is completely preventable. Then there are non-preventable uh, hospital-acquired infection in which uh, the infection will occur despite all the possible precautions, uh, like if the patient is immunosuppressed or immunocompromised due to his or own, own flora, uh, you know, the infection occurs. And these are usually cannot be prevented or not preventable regardless of whatever the uh, precautions are taken by the healthcare workers. Uh, then for the hospital associated infections, you know, what are the surveillance and which are the uh, main uh, infections we follow up? Uh, these are the surgical site infections, the ventilator associated pneumonia, catheter associated urinary tract infections, and the catheter related bloodstream infections. Now we'll take these uh, all these one by one. So starting with the SSI, that is the surgical site infection. First of all, the definition that what we call as a surgical site infection. Uh, infection in the surgical site that occurs within 30 days of the surgical procedure or within one hour in case of a implant or a foreign body uh, in the surgery. Few of the surgeries in which uh, we take 90 days also, uh, you know, after the surgical procedure, but that's a, a different list which I can provide later if you want. But most of all, it's uh, 30 days and uh, one year for the case of implants. Uh, then again, these are SSIs are divided into incisional SSIs and organ space SSIs. Incisional, superficial incisional, and the deep incisional. Uh, the superficial incis uh, incisional involves only the skin and subcutaneous tissue infection, and the deep incisional will involve the deep soft tissues, that is the fascia or the muscle layers. And uh, infection that involves both the superficial and deep uh, is also classified under the deep incisional. Uh, then there is the organ space in which there is any part of the anatomy, that is the organ or spaces other than the incision that was opened or manipulated during the operative procedure. If that becomes infected, then also appears to be related to the surgical procedure. It's called as the organ or space SSI. Uh, then what, what do we include under the, uh, these uh, SSIs? Uh, in the superficial incisional SSI, uh, the following criteria must uh, be met to it, uh, it to be categorized under the uh, you know, superficial SSI. Uh, so if an infection occurs within 30 days after the operative procedure and involves only the skin and subcutaneous tissue of the incision, and patient has at least one of the following, that is it can be either a purulent drainage from the superficial incision, Organism isolated uh, from aseptically obtained culture uh, or the tissue uh, culture fluid or the tissue from the incision or the signs or symptoms of like uh, infection like pain or tenderness, localized swelling, redness, heat uh, and is culture positive or not cultured. If it's a culture negative finding, then it will not meet this criteria. And uh, diagnosis of superficial incisional SSI by the surgeon or by the attending physician. If these criteria are met, then we can be putting it or categorizing it under the superficial SSI. Uh, for deep incisional SSI, then the five uh, the following criteria again uh, most of more or less similar that infection occurs within 30 days after the operative procedure. Uh, if no implant or uh, one year if there's an implant, uh, prudent drainage from the deep incision, but not from the organ space component, because that will come under then the uh, organ or space SSI. Uh, then deep incisions spontaneously dehesis or deliberately opened by the surgeon and is culture positive or not culture. 
and if the patient has uh, the signs of uh, infection like fever, localized pain or tenderness, again, a culture negative finding will not meet this criteria. And an abscess or other evidence of infection involving the deep incision is found on direct examination or if the diagnosis is made by the surgeon or the attending physician. Uh, then coming to the exclusion criteria that what all is not included or put it uh, put under the SSI like a stage abscess that is minimal inflammation on a particular uh, one or two sutures. Uh, then a localized stab wound infection is not to be reported at SSI. Instead, it's put it as skin or soft tissue infection. Uh, uh, the circumcision site uh, infection in newborn is not put in the SSI. An infected burn wound is reported as burn and not put as the SSIs. Then coming to the uh, formulas for, uh, you know, calculation of the rates of SSI. Uh, for this, you know, we divide our uh, SSIs into uh, four different categories. Uh, depending on the what kind of, uh, you know, surgery has been done. Uh, for this, we are dividing the surgeries also put into four categories and depending on that, uh, we are dividing the SSIs also into these four categories. Uh, these four categories will be uh, clean cases, clean contaminated cases, contaminated cases and dirty infected cases. Uh, so as we'll uh, just come to that also that how we are dividing into these uh, four categories. Uh, so based on these four categories of surgeries, we are dividing the SSIs also onto, into these four categories. Uh, so in clean cases, so number of SSI in clean cases divided by total number of clean surgeries into 100. Similarly, in clean contaminated cases, number of SSI in clean contaminated cases divided by total number of clean contaminated surgery. Similarly, for contaminated cases and for dirty infected cases. Now, clean cases, how we are defining it, what are called as the clean cases. Uh, these are defined as an uninfected operative wound in which no inflammation is encountered. Respiratory, elementary, genital or uninfected urinary tract is not entered. It's primarily closed and if necessary, drained with a closed drainage. And the operative incisional wounds that follow blunt that is the non-penetrating trauma are also included if they meet this criteria. These are defined as the clean cases. Then the clean contaminated are an operative wound in which the respiratory, elementary, genital or urinary tracts are entered under controlled conditions and without unusual contamination. Specifically, operations of the biliary tract Appendix, vagina, and oropharynx are included if there's no evidence of infection or major break technique in these cases. Then is the contaminated, the third group, which are defined as the open, fresh, or accidental wounds. We because we do accept some, uh, expect some, uh, you know, uh, dirt or some uh, infected uh, uh, material in that already. Operations with major break and sterile technique, uh, like in case of a open cardiac massage. Operations with gross spillage from the gastrointestinal tract, like the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, when the, uh, this, uh, uh, the gastrointestinal tract spillage has occurred in the peritoneal cavity, like incisions in which acute non purulent inflammation is encountered while you are doing the operation itself. These are uh, classified as contaminated cases. Then the dirty infected cases, these are old traumatic wounds with retained uh, devitalized tissues, old traumatic wounds that involve the existing clinical uh, infection, and old traumatic wounds that involve the perforated viscera. These will be put as dirty infected. Coming to bundle of uh, prevention, you know, that is the basic practices for prevention and monitoring of the SSIs, uh, which will be recommended for all the acute care hospitals. First of all is the surveillance, uh, to have to perform the surveillance for SSI, uh, provide ongoing feedback on SSI surveillance and the process measures to surgical department and uh, team, and increase the efficiency of uh, surveillance through the use of automated data. In the practice, uh, you know, administer the antimicrobial prophylaxis in accordance with uh, the evidence-based standards and the guidelines. Measure and provide feedback on compliance with the process measures, including the antimicrobial prof uh, prophylaxis, proper hair removal, glucose control, etc. 
implement policies and practices aimed at reducing the risk of SSI that are aligned with evidence-based standard example of as per the CDC and prevention and professional organization guidelines. Coming to the education part, uh, very, very important, you know, to educate the surgeons and the uh, perioperative personnel about the SSI prevention, educate the patients and their families about SSI prevention as appropriate, uh, special approaches for the prevention of SSI to perform an SSI risk assessment, that is where there is a more probability of uh, uh, being SSI if the patient is not uh, uh, diabetic control or sugar is high or as such, you know, suppressed. Then these special approaches are recommended for use in location as or on population within the hospital uh, for which the outcome data or risk assessment suggests there's a lack of effective control. Uh, in spite of, uh, you know, implementation of all the basic practices. Uh, perform the expanded uh, SSI surveillance to determine the source and extent of the problem and to identify the possible target for intervention. Uh, what should not be considered as a routine part of SSI prevention, like use of vancomycin for antimicrobial prophylaxis, can, uh, though the vancomycin can be an appropriate agent for a specific clinical circumstances when you are, uh, it's required to be given, but not as a routine. And do not routinely delay the surgery just to provide the uh, parental nutrition. Uh, the if you see uh, as the what is the you know acceptable uh, infective risk uh, percentages uh, that's why we were dividing uh, the surgeries and the exercise into four different categories because this uh, uh, infective risk varies uh, and which uh, at least should be our uh, target goals less than this to be uh, uh, you know uh, uh, less than this to be achieved. Uh, for clean class one, like, uh, you know, as, as we have described what, uh, what we mean by uh, clean class one, uh, that is the uninfected operative wound, no acute inflammation, the infective risk percentage is less than two. Uh, for clean contaminated, that is the class two, it's less than 10%. Uh, for contaminated, class three is uh, approximately 20%. And for dirty infected, uh, class four is approximately as uh, 40%. And the factors that may influence the risk of SSI uh, development, we divide it into two as the patient-centric and the operative-centric. Uh, in patient, uh, what factors can influence is the age, nutritional status, uh, the diabetic status, smoking, obesity, any coexistent infection at a remote body site, any colonization with microorganisms, any altered immune response or length of the preoperative state. And the operative part, uh, like the duration of surgical scrub, uh, scrub the skin uh, antisepsis, uh, preoperative shaving, the preoperative skin preparation, duration of operation, antimicrobial prophylaxis given, operation room ventilation, <coughs> inadequate, <coughs> inadequate sterilization of instrument, foreign material in the surgical site, surgical. and the tissue trauma. Coming to the uh, SSI surveillance part, uh, and uh, you know, the choice of which uh, operations to monitor, it uh, that decision should be taken jointly as uh, Dr. Gomti was already discussing how we make the committees and all. And it can be taken by the committee jointly by the surgeon and the infection control personnel uh, that which operation they need to follow specifically. And uh, should uh, most, probably should target, uh, you know, the surveillance towards the high risk procedures because we need to control the exercise uh, uh, most importantly in those uh, groups. Uh, <clears throat> so the inpatient uh, exercise surveillance uh, can be uh, by two methods, that is by direct observation or by indirect, uh, which can be done alone or together. Usually it will be helpful if they are done, uh, you know, in a multi uh, approach. Uh, in the direct observation uh, is by the surgical side by the surgeon or the trained nurse or the infection control uh, personnel. And the indirect detection is by the, you know, through review of your lab uh, reports, data, patient records, and the discussion with the primary care providers. Uh, direct observation obviously uh, is the most accurate method to detect exercise and the uh, surgeon has to report all exercise detected either in hospital or on follow-up to the infection control nurse and the committee along with the complete patient details. 
and the frequency SSI case uh, finding varies from daily, uh, you know, to three times per week. Uh, it and uh, it should continue till the patient is discharged from the hospital. And nowadays, uh, is as the uh, you know stay in the hospital after surgery has become uh, uh, very very short. Uh, okay, and uh, since the, as I said, uh, since the uh, uh, this thing has become very short, uh, you know, the stay, uh, we have to follow up uh, this, uh, you know, uh, uh, post discharge also to follow up to check for the SSI surveillance and whether uh, it's done by the phone calls or by, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, subsequent visit of the patient to the hospital. Uh, but it's very, very important uh, at least uh, to follow up the patient for 30 days or uh, uh, as in the case of implants for one year to get the correct, uh, you know, method of the uh, uh, correct uh, figures for the SSIs. Uh, I'm not, please move this in window away. I'm not able to remove it. How do I do that? Okay, it's better now. Okay, so now the uh, post discharge SSI, most SSI becomes uh, evident uh, within 21 days after the operation. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, many SSIs may not be detected, as I said, uh, for several weeks after discharge. And uh, then if we are only dependent on the inpatient case finding, uh, we will not be able to uh, get the correct data. So very, very important is to, you know, go do the uh, post-discharge surveillance uh, in which uh, the method can be decided, like the direct examination of patient wounds during the follow-up, uh, review of the medical records of the surgery uh, clinic patients, or uh, you have to call up uh, patient service by mail or telephone or surgeon service by mail or uh, telephone. Okay, now coming to, uh, to the second one, that is uh, the ventilator associated pneumonia, also called as the VAP. Uh, that's the very second most important, uh, you know, uh, uh, for the hospital associated infections. Uh, it's the leading cause of death among the uh, hospital uh, associated infection because uh, as such, the patients are very sick and, uh, you know, they are already on ventilator, so, uh, and mainly in the ICUs. And uh, this, uh, you know, has become one of the leading causes of death because most of the time you'll hear the patient never dies of the, you know, primary uh, uh, cause, uh, you know, for which, but because of the septicemia or infection or pneumonia. Uh, that's why it's very, very important, you know, uh, to follow the VAP bundle, which is already established and written by the Institute of Healthcare Improvement and is recognized as a standard of care. There are four distinct uh, elements that must be instituted, referred to as a bundle. Uh, that is elevation of the head of the bed, uh, daily sedation, uh, vacation, and daily formal assessment of readiness for weaning, prophylaxis against the deep uh, venous thrombosis, unless contraindicated, and prophylaxis against the peptic ulcer disease.
the most uh, prevalent bacteria are the gram negative bacilli, that is the Pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa and Enterobacteriaceae, and the gram positive organism that is the Staph aureus. Uh, coming to the inclusion criteria, uh, when, when will we consider it as a VAP, that is the ventilator associated pneumonia? Uh, uh, either radiological, two or more uh, serial test uh, radiographs with at least one of the following, that is new or progressive and persistent infiltrate. A consolidation has been discovered, cavitation has been discovered, or in nematocytes in infants less than one year old. Uh, in patients who are uh, without any underlying pulmonary or cardiac disease, uh, that is the respiratory distress syndrome, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, pulmonary edema, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, then even one definitive test radi radiograph is acceptable as the criteria. Otherwise, two or more serial Test radiograph will be considered for it to be considered as VAP. Coming to the clinical um, uh, criteria uh, with a fever more than uh, 38 degrees centigrade or uh, greater than uh, 100.4 uh, with no other uh, recognized cause, leukopenia or leukocytosis. Uh, for adults uh, greater than 70 years, altered mental status with no other recognized cause or at least a uh, new onset of purulent sputum or change in character of sputum, increased respiratory secretions, new onset of worsening cough or dyspnea, rails of bronchial breath sound or worsening gas exchange, that is the increased gas uh, oxygen requirement or increased ventilator demand. The microbiological criteria, <clears throat> sample for culture obtained by one of the following shows growth, Uh, protected, uh, you know, from uh, protected breast specimens, uh, bronchioalveolar lavage, deep endotracheal tube suctioning. Uh, the exclusion criteria is uh, if the patient has been intubation done before arrival at the hospital and uh, there's an evidence of aspiration prior to intubation, then it won't be included under the VAP. Coming to the formula of calculation. Uh, in the medical uh, cases, you can divide it into medical cases, surgical cases, and neurosurgical cases. Uh, we have, Most of the hospitals have a separate ICUs for these also. Uh, so number of VAP in medical cases divided by number of ventilator days. And uh, ventilator days for a month is uh, calculated or uh, arrived at by counting every uh, medical patient on a ventilator each day. Like each day, what uh, number of patients on ventilator like this for 30 days, uh, this total is taken as the uh, denominator for the number of ventilator days. And in this, the number of VAP uh, will be put in the numerator divided by that into 1000 is taken as your uh, uh, number of uh, uh, VAP. Uh, similarly, can be calculated for surgical cases and for the neurosurgical cases. Coming to uh, bundle of prevention. Uh, basic practices for prevention and monitoring of VAP, uh, which has been recommended for all acute uh, care hospitals. First of all is the education. Educate the healthcare personnel who care for patients undergoing ventilation and about VAP, including the information about local epidemiology, risk factors, and patient outcomes. Educate clinicians who care for patients undergoing ventilation about non-invasive ventilatory strategies. Surveillance perform the direct observation of compliance with VAP specific process measures, conduct the active surveillance for VAP and the associated measures in uh, units uh, where the patient are undergoing ventilation and are suspected to be high risk for VAP on the basis of the risk assessment. In the practice, implement the policies and practices of dis uh, disinfection, sterilization, maintenance of respiratory equipment, Ensure that all patients, except those with the medical contraindications, are maintained in a semi, uh, uh, you know, recommended position. Perform regular antiseptic oral care. Uh, provide easy access to non-invasive uh, ventilation equipment and protocols to remove, uh, promote the use of non-invasive ventilation. Coming to special approaches for prevention of VAP. Again, to perform a VAP risk assessment, these special approaches are recommended for use in locations and population within the hospital 
for which the outcome data and risk assessment suggests a lack of effective control despite the implementation of the basic practices. That means where there's a higher risk that patient will develop the pneumonia, then you have to be more, uh, you know, uh, particular uh, uh, and more uh, specific or try to do as much as possible. Use an endotracheal tube with inline and subglottic suctioning uh, for all eligible patients. What should not be considered as a routine part of VAP prevention is do not routinely administer the intravenous immunoglobulin by cell stimulating factors. Do not routinely use the rotational therapy with kinetic, kinetic or continuous lateral rotational therapy beds. And do not routinely administer prophylactic aerolyzed or systematic antimicrobials. As for the risk factors and preventions, uh, duration of intubation to be the minimum, limited, Invasive ventilation to be preferred non-invasive wherever it's possible. In the ventilation procedures, intubation and uh, suction, aseptic technique should be uh, used. As per the filters, disposable filters should be used. Water for oxygen and aerosol, water should be sterile and changed every 24 hours. Tracheal toilet, aseptic technique should be used. Tubing, respirators and humidifiers, sterile with aseptic technique should be used. Suction tubes sterile with aseptic technique should be used and humidifier bottle should be sterilized between uses. Coming to COTI, that is your catheter associated uh, urinary tract infection. In hospitalized patient, in acute care, about 40% of, uh, you know, Hospital associated infections are urinary tract related. And most of these infections follow the instrumentation of urinary tract, that is the catheterization. So, not all catheter associated UTIs can be prevented, but it's you know believed that a large number can be if a proper management of the indwelling catheter is done. So the guidelines which uh, pertain to the care of the patients with temporary indwelling urethral cat catheter and patients who require long-term indwelling catheters and who can be managed with intermittent catheterization, uh, different needs and require separate consideration. We are not going to talk about them at the moment. Coming to the inclusion criteria, what will be considered as a COTI? Signs or symptoms with no other recognized cause, that is fever, urgency, frequency, dysuria, which are the uh, you know, symptoms of UTI and suprapubic tenderness. And the pathological uh, criteria, that is a positive dipstick for leukocyte esterase and or nitrate, pyuria, that is in the routine microscopic urine uh, examination. Uh, with uh, more than 10 WBC per cubic millimeter or more than 3 WBC hyper hyper field of spun urine. Organism seen on gram stain of the unspun urine. Then the microbiological criteria that is a positive culture of not more than two organisms with more than 10 to the power 5 colonies per ml in urine or a positive culture between 10 to the power 3 to 10 to the power 5 5 per, per ml uh, urine, not more than two organisms, along with one of the pathological signs. See, if a microbiological, uh, not more than two organisms with the clinical sign and symptoms uh, is considered, uh, you know, you have these many colony count is considered as a uh, confirmatory. But if it, the organism or the number of colony count is between 10 to the power 3 to 10 to the power 4, 5, then along with the clinical signs and symptoms, must have one of the pathological criteria, whether it's a positive dipstick or a pyuria in the routine or organism seen on ground stain of the unspun unit, at least one of them. And very important is, uh, it's been, uh, you know, again and again emphasized that urine culture must be obtained using appropriate techniques, that, that is clean, catch, midstream collection or catheterization. Coming to overview, you know, as the uh, criteria must have symptoms, that is very, very important, must have symptoms and 
then they have been divided into four different criteria group that is uh, a and b are divided a criteria is used for catheter at or within 48 hours prior to urine collection or onset of signs or symptoms and b criteria is no catheter at within 48 hours prior to urine collection or onset of signs or symptoms so with symptoms urine culture with more than 10 to the power 5 colony forming unit and no more than two species criteria 2 a and b urine culture between 10 to the power 3 and 10 to the power 5 colony forming units no not more than two species and positive urine analysis system uh, um, one of the criteria of urine analysis the pathological criteria we have given criteria 3 and 4 that is for patients less than one year of age and have age specific signs and symptoms and urine culture more than 10 to the power 5 not more than two species and criteria four, urine culture between 10 to the power three and 10 to the power five, no more than two species and positive urine analysis. This is again, it's uh, written the same thing. It has been put again. Coming to the exclusion criteria, a positive culture of urinary catheter tip is not an acceptable lab test for diagnosing a UTI. And for the formula of calculation of the UTI is number of uh, catheter associated UTI divided by number of catheter days into 1000. And a UTI in a patient who has an indwelling urinary catheter in place at the time of or within 48 hours prior to infection onset is taken as a catheter associated UTI. How the catheter days for the month is calculated is by counting every patient with an indwelling urinary catheter each day. And then this whole for 30 days is taken as a data for month. Bundle prevention. So basic practices for prevention and monitoring of COTI, which are recommended again for all acute care hospitals. Appropriate infrastructure for preventing COTI is provide and implement written guide, guidelines for catheter use, insertion, and maintenance. Ensure that only trained, dedicated personnel insert the urinary catheters. Ensure that supplies necessary for aseptic techniques, catheter insertion are available. Implement a system for documenting the following information in the patient record. That is indications for catheter insertion, date and time of insertion, individual who inserted the catheter, and date and time of removal. Ensure that there are sufficient trained personnel and technology resources to support the surveillance of the catheter use and outcome. Coming to surveillance, identify the patient groups or units in which to conduct the surveillance. And as we said again and again, that based on the risk assessment, uh, and considering the frequency of catheter use and the potential risk factors, that is in which uh, surgery or which department more catheters are used, uh, you should be taking up those uh, department first for uh, doing the surveillance of the COTI. Use standardized criteria to identify patients who have COTI, that will be your numerator data. A UTI in a patient who had an indwelling urinary catheter in place, as we said, in the time or within 48 hours prior to infection onset is to only to be considered as a case of 40. Note, uh, very important, no minimum period of time that the catheter must be in place. It's not required whether the catheter is there for one day, two days, then only you will be considering it only for uh, 40. Okay, collect information on catheter days, that is the denominator. I have already told you how you have to calculate that. And the uh, 40 rates for the target population and use surveillance method for case finding that are appropriate for institution and are documented to be valid. Hello. Education and training. Educate the health personnel involved in the insertion, care, and maintenance of the urinary catheters about the COTI prevention, including alternatives to indwelling catheters and procedures for catheter insertion, management, and review, uh, removal. The appropriate techniques should be uh, used. They are very, very important. Insert uh, catheters only when, only as long as the indications persist. Consider other methods for management, including the condom catheters, 
or in and out catheterization wherever appropriate and possible. Practice hand hygiene immediately before insertion and before and after any manipulation of the catheter site or apparatus. Insert catheters by use of aseptic techniques and sterile equipment. Use gloves, drapes, sponges, sterile or antiseptic solution for cleaning the urethral meters and a single use packet of sterile lubricant jelly for insertion. Use as small a catheter as possible, uh, you know, that is consistent with proper drainage to, you know, minimize the urethral trauma. Properly secure the indwelling catheters after insertion to prevent movement and urethral traction. Maintain a sterile continuously closed drainage system. Do not disconnect the catheter and drainage tubes unless the catheter must be irrigated. For examination of fresh urine, collect a small sample by aspirating urine from the sampling port. That is the sampling port in the catheter which is there with a sterile needle and syringe after cleaning the port with disinfectant. Obtain large volumes of urine for special analysis aseptically from the drainage bag. Maintain unobstructed urine flow. Empty the collecting bag regularly using a separate collecting container for each patient and avoid allowing the drainage figure to touch the collecting container. And keep the collecting bag very, very important below the level of the bladder at all times to have an unobstructed flow of the urine. Approaches that should not be considered a routine part of faulty prevention. Do not routinely use the silver coated or other antibacterial uh, catheters. Do not uh, screen for asymptomatic bacteria and catheterized patient. Do not treat asymptomatic bacteria and catheterized patient except before invasive urological procedures. Avoid catheter irrigation. Do not use systemic uh, antimicrobial routinely as prophylaxis and do not change the catheters routinely. Coming to the fourth one uh, uh, in this, that is the central line associated bloodstream infection, the CLAPSI. And the common uh, pathogens associated are coagulase negative staph, staph aureus, enterococcus, E. coli, enterobacter, pseudomonas, klebsiella, and candida. Coming to the inclusion criteria of CLAPSI, uh, the lab confirmed the bloodstream infection. Uh, that is the criteria one and two may be used for patients of any age, including uh, a <clears throat> patient less than one year of age also, but must meet at least one of the following criteria. That is, uh, I mean, the one or two. One is that patient has a recognized pathogen, that is staph, aureus, enterococcus, E. coli, pseudomonas, klebsiella, candida, cultured from one or more blood cultures, and the organism cultured from blood is not related to an infection at another site. Or patient has at least one of the following signs and symptoms, that is fever, chills, hypotension, positive lab results are not related to an infection or at another site, and a common skin contaminant, that is diphthroid, bacillus, propaneobacterium, coagulase negative staph, viridian group staph, aerococcus, micrococcus species is cultured from two or more blood cultures drawn on separate occasions. The exclusion criteria are purulent phlebitis confirmed with positive semi-quantitative culture of catheter tip, but with either negative or no blood culture is considered as a not a bloodstream infection. Formula for calculation of uh, rate is number of uh, uh, you know bloodstream infection divided by number of central line days into thousand. Again, the central light days for the month is calculated by counting every patient with an indwelling central line each day and taking it for the full month. Coming to bundle for prevention. Basic practices for prevention and mon monitoring of CLAPSI, which is recommended for all acute care hospitals is before insertion, that is educate healthcare personnel involved in the insertion, care and maintenance of the central venous catheters about the prevention requirements. At insertion, use a catheter checklist 
to ensure adherence to the infection prevention practices at the time of central venous uh, insertion, catheter insertion, perform hand hygiene before insertion or manipulation, avoid using the femoral vein for central venous excess, use an all-inclusive catheter cart or kit, use maximal sterile barrier precautions during central venous uh, insertion, Use a spirit povidone iodine based antiseptic for skin preparation in patients older than two months of age. After insertion, disinfect catheter hubs, needle, uh, needless con connectors, injection ports for accessing the catheter, remove non uh, essential catheters. For non tenured uh, central venous catheters in adults and adolescents, change the transparent dressings and perform the site care with spirit povidone iodine based uh, antiseptic every five to seven days or more frequently if the dressing is soiled, loose or damp and change the gauze dressing every two days or more frequently. Replace the administration sets not used for blood, blood products or lipids at interval not uh, longer than the 72 hours and perform surveillance for clapsy and use antimicrobial ointment for hemodialysis catheter insertion sites. The approaches that should not be considered a retuin part of the clapsy prevention. Do not use the antimicrobial prophylaxis for short-term or tunneled catheter insertion or while catheters are in situ. Do not routinely replace uh, central venous catheters or arterial catheters. Do not routinely use positive pressure uh, Needleless connectors with mechanical walls uh, before a thorough assessment of risk benefit and education. Coming to the infection risk and prevention, the catheter system to be avoided unless indicated and closed system to be maintained. Duration, prolonged, uh, obviously the prolonged catheterization to be avoided. Skin preparation, strict aseptic technique to be used. Infection or colonization of catheter should uh, catheter should be removed and changed. Uh, surgical asepsis technique should be used. Frequency of dressing dressing change to be limited, and antibiotic catheter for short term is preferred. Uh, the quality indicators. Uh, the different definitions, these are the four quality indicators uh, routinely you know, followed for uh, hospital-associated infections. Uh, the exercise, what we have talked about, the exercise, uh, VAP, uh, the COTI, and the CLAPC. I have already told you how we have to calculate these. And, uh, you know, all these are very, very important for, uh, uh, you know, maintaining and reducing the uh, hospital-associated infections. These are few of the forms, you know, which can be used for uh, uh, your calculating uh, your uh, this quality indicators. Uh, just a format like for VAP, uh, you can, as I told you, we can divide it into medical, uh, surgical, neurosurgical cases. Uh, then uh, total ventilator days, number of infection, and the month was, uh, wise uh, VAP rate can be calculated. Similarly, for the surgical and the neurosurgical. For 40, again, uh, that you have the total catheter days, uh, number of infections, and the 40 rate. Uh, if you, you know, put it in this kind of a format, it helps you to uh, follow the, uh, you know, the progress uh, month-wise also. Uh, CLAPSI, again, uh, now total central line days, number of infections, and the CLAPSI rate. SSI, we are dividing, as I said, into four categories. So for the clean, clean contaminated, contaminated and the dirty infectious cases, all four to be followed up separately because the percentage, uh, acceptable percentage, you know, differs. Uh, so must divide, uh, you know, divide the surgical cases into these four um, uh, different categories and then follow up with the SSIs. Contaminated, dirty. These are just a few of the example of the uh, surveillance forms, you know, uh, uh, which can be used uh, while collecting the data. Uh, like for SSI surveillance, uh, 
you can have obviously with the name is uh, the details uh, then uh, can name of the surgery whether emergency elective then uh, pre operative variables uh, like shaving clipping hair removal uh, hair removal done not done immediate before surgery 12 hours before surgery 24 hours before surgery then the pre existing conditions medical conditions which are important and will uh, are uh, contributory to you know exercise like diabetes, obesity, anemia, any concurrent infections, smoker, then ESS score, duration of surgery, timing of antibiotic prophylaxis, post-operative stay. All this, you know, data collection is uh, reach, uh, uh, you know, okay, what can, what is the cause and how to do a CAPA if uh, you have uh, got a surgical site infection. Treatment details, pre-operative prophylaxis, drug, dose, route, administrative time before surgery, post-operative prescription, uh, in which all the, the you know, details of the what antibiotic given, dose, route, start date, stop date, number of days it was given, all this to be record, recorded, you know, only then only we'll be able to, uh, uh, you know, analyze it and reach, uh, do a proper CAPA. Uh, name of uh, the treating doctor surgical site inspection infection by infection control nurse all this detail to be uh, you know uh, gathered in the surveillance form similarly we have a, a corti surveillance form again with the details of the patient uh, then uh, patient admitted with police catheter or uh, uh, if, uh, date of police catheter in, uh, you know insertion removal number of uh, catheter days name of consultant, primary diagnosis, then the symptoms, the date uh, and which symptoms, fever, urgency, suprapubic tenderness, abscess in GU, leukocytosis, localization of uh, other foci, uh, any uh, other foci of infection, the lab reports, uh, you know, what the date, uh, the urine culture, blood culture, and the leucorrhea or the leukocyte estrays or the nitrate. Uh, then uh, the sign symptom of UTI after 48 hours of hospital admission, pyuria after 48 hours, and positive urine culture after 48 hours, all these to be recorded. Then you have the CLAPSI surveillance form also, again with the data of the patient. Then uh, blood culture positive on what organism, date of insertion of the uh, uh, catheter, uh, date of insertion of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, central line, date of removal, uh, peripheral line, if any there, fever, any counts, uh, thrombophlebitis or the central line, peripheral line, the other. Localizing signs of infection uh, on the day of the fever, positive blood culture, any sign symptom of UTI, sign symptom of pneumonia, any sign symptom of wound infection, meningitis, bacteremia, all this to be recorded in the surveillance form. Similarly, for the VAP surveillance form, uh, then again, the date of the patient, patient on ventilator, date of endotracheal uh, insertion, X-ray findings, two or more serial X-rays are uh, to be done every third day. Any new progressive or the persistent infiltrate, any consolidation, cavitation, nematocils, uh, clinical sign symptom with fever, cough, crepes, increased ventilation demand, worsening gas exchange, uh, the lab results with the date, TLC, sputum, uh, blood culture, uh, aspirate, the ball, uh, and the tracheal aspirator, the pleural field, and all the cultures must be accompanied by the gram stain report. All these to be recorded in the surveillance forms. Just to end, you know, all of us know sepsis accounts for nearly one out of every two to three patients' deaths in the hospital. And very, very important. This is us. Uh, we have not uh, got a uh, lot of Indian data. We have got uh, the American data. So you can imagine the India data is far more worse than the what the other data we are getting from the other uh, developed countries. So very, very important. DZ sepsis is the leading cause of early admissions. Uh, more at most occurrence of sepsis are, are you know, present on admission. Length of the stay is increased by 75%. And it can lead to a lot of, uh, you know, uh, 
expenditure uh, for the patient, uh, for the insurance companies, for the hospitals. The first rule of uh, what we are taught in our medical school and college is let uh, do no harm. So please, please, that's why it's very, very important to uh, manage and monitor this hospital associated and healthcare associated infection uh, to reduce their burden to the patient. Thank you very much. Uh, any